uh, and then one of the other chapters is called uh, The Two Greatest Conspiracies Ever, and um, this is where start the discussion of the Sumerians and the civilization that started there. And, you know, it's mentioned that the Sumerians believe that there were 12 planets, including one between Mars and Jupiter. Uh, I was quite interested to read about that because I've read about that elsewhere. Um, and it's, you know, what you'd written in this part was very similar to what I'd read elsewhere. But then um, I, I was quite interested to hear this remark from the Carlton Farr character. The two greatest conspiracies conducted by church and state have to do with the suppression of all the evidence of ancient gods, quote-unquote, and their involvement in the creation of humankind, and the fact that these so-called gods have returned. Um, and so, you know, what, what made you think to put this in the book, you know, was this something you'd, you'd, you'd sort of been researching as well, along with your own, or was it spoken of by your contacts, or, uh, you know, was it another source? Uh, through research and talking to people like uh, Dr. Farr and uh, Brad Steiger, it became obvious at some point that it seemed like uh, historically out of nowhere in the, the cradle of civilization, uh, the, the Sumerians in the Middle East, uh, all of a sudden they had roads and aqueducts and uh, libraries and math and science, uh, agriculture, organized agriculture and husbandry. And it was just almost overnight. Yeah. yeah. This massive, well-educated civilization appeared. And historically, it's a, a real anomaly. And most people don't realize it, that there are literally tens of thousands of clay tablets left over from the Sumerian civilization almost 6,000 years ago. Uh, documenting this, and the Sumerians all believed that their civilization, their very existence, uh, was created by uh, people from space, uh, a higher form of intelligence from space. Yeah, so th okay. this has all been documented. And of course, I mean, all you got to do is watch Ancient Aliens and some of those other shows, do some research, and you can see there's just a plethora. Of artifacts and, and, and documented evidence going back 6,000 years. Absolutely. Well, I, I, I absolutely agree. And uh, I was just, again, I was interested to find that um, sort of discussed in the book at some length. Um, okay, so I think going through. Yeah, and then so there's a chapter called The Killing Room. And within that, there's a, like a, two of the characters are talking. The Agabar character, who's the. Um, the kind of, uh, you know, the Inquisition guy, the torturer, um, he, he states in his character that uh, MJ-12 is above the NSA in authority, um, and I just wondered, you know, what your thoughts are, are about a, an authority above the NSA, and, you know, uh, did you have any thoughts on that? Well, at first I wasn't sure of the Majestic 12 or MJ-12 group, but there's been so many documents that have been discovered by People like Red Steiger, Jamie Shandera, Stanton Friedman, uh, Dr. Wood, uh, that have been authenticated and uh, some have even been found in the National Archives. So obviously at one point there was a group that controlled all the information and artifacts dealing with uh, uh, alien vehicles or even the aliens themselves. But it's probably most likely not called the Majestic 12 anymore. And if you look at the uh, Truman document, for example, MJ-12 document, uh, you'll see there are some of the best scientists and also uh, most powerful men in America. So no doubt if there was a, uh, and there is obviously a secret government that pulls the strings. That's why I don't believe in a two-party system anymore. I, uh, I think there's a corporate system and they play both parties and, uh, but there's got to be a group that, that's calling the shots. And right. it would be obvious, right. it'd be obvious you'd have somebody like, uh, Eli Gerald in the book, the director of, ex-director of the NSA. You would have people like that on the board or on the committee. Yes. Yeah. That, that makes sense to me as well. Yeah. Yes. Answered that question. But yeah. So, um, Far agreed enthusiastically, this is one of the quotes from the next chapter on here to help you. Uh, 
The planet existed at one time in ancient prehistory between Mars and Jupiter, where the asteroid belt now lies, and it is very probable that Mars served as a temporary home base for the aliens before they visited Earth. So I was interested, you know, on your on your thoughts again about the this possible, uh, you know, additional planet that was in the solar system and now isn't. Any thoughts on that? Well, it is a scientific theory. It's one of several. Uh, there's proponents, uh, scientists that uh, believe that at one time the asteroid belt was part of a planet uh, because there's so much massive uh, amounts of debris that there been a, might have been a planet about the size of Mars, between Mars and Jupiter. Uh, some people even hypothesize that MJ stood for Mars, Jupiter, the 12th planet. Uh, that's another hypothesis. But if not, uh, if not a 12th planet, then, uh, other people think that it, one time there was a civilization on Mars. And if you look into the massive amount of Mars anomalies and the artifacts that have been, haven't been airbrushed that have slipped through the screening process from NASA and JPL airbrushing everything or deleting pictures from public view, uh, you can almost convince yourself that there was a civilization that either lived on a, uh, a 12th planet between Mars and Jupiter or actually had a civilization on Mars. Yeah, I mean, that's for decades happened. they've known, for decades they've known there's microorganisms on Mars and they've known there's water on Mars, but for decades they've been telling us there's no water on Mars, it's uninhabitable and there's no microorganisms and now they're telling us, oh well, yeah. We were wrong. Well, I, 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 I think to, to our presentation on that, yeah. Uh, I, I not only think they were wrong, I think they lied about it and covered it up all these decades. One of the things that's mentioned in the book briefly, sort of in passing, is the weapons development that's gone on in Area 51. And, uh, you know, obviously in that area, in the Nevada area, the, there was a lot of nuclear tests, which I think we've already mentioned. But what about other weapons testing? Is that something you ever became aware of? Weapons testing that went on there with exotic weapons of any kind? Or was that something that, you know, uh, you, know you didn't really have any, any specific information about? Well, uh, like I said, the people that live in Nevada call it the conspiracy state. The uh, old Atomic Energy Commission set off a couple hundred uh, nukes. I think 100, about 160 above ground and probably another 50 below ground. That's the most irradiated <laughs> and contaminated state in North America, too. Uh, but, uh, yes, I was involved in several bike programs, and uh, some of them later came out as production, like the F-117. Um, there were others that... Uh, I might be able to talk about it next year because I had a 35 year, uh, basically commitment not to talk about certain things. And, uh, that'll, that'll come up when I'm 66 next year. Or, I mean, not next year, but actually next month. And, uh, a lot of people ask, well, how could you have told all these things that you've told and them not kill you or lock you up somewhere? The ma matter of fact is, is that during that emergency where they needed somebody to come up there and maintain and repair uh, the satellite and crypto gear, uh, I had a top secret clearance. I also had a crypto clearance, crypto access and training. Uh, they didn't ask me to sign anything. So yeah. I guess they just yeah. assumed since I already had a top secret clearance and already signed documents relating to other stuff that, uh, I was covered, but it, it fell through the cracks. Somebody dropped the ball. Yes. So my yes. my experience at the Groom Air Base that I talk about and other things that I talk about, I was under no specific oath. However, talking about other black programs, uh, I did sign secrecy oaths yes. and other documents, yes. debriefings, and I haven't talked about them. I've only alluded to them when they become slightly public, and then I can talk more about them. Um, so the question I'd had was about the Los Alamos, because that's something I've had great interest in, because I've come across that several times in my research. So in, in this chapter it says, 
The remains of the alien space vehicles were taken to initially to Los Alamos for the simple reasons that they had developed the A-bomb. They were closest to the crash and they could provide the necessary security. The materials, debris and later some of the vehicle's pieces were taken to Wright-Patterson, or Wright Field as it was called then, and the bodies were never taken to Wright-Patterson. You know, we know, of course, all these stories vary from what I've heard about where the bodies and stuff were taken, but I had not heard that Los Alamos was involved with the, with the Roswell crash. So what is your thoughts on Los Alamos being involved in the, uh, you know, the, the Roswell crash and the re recovery and the, you know, dealing with the materials and so on? Um, from my investigations over the last couple of decades, uh, it definitely appears like Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio, and uh, Carswell Air Force Base in Fort Worth, Texas, which is now closed, is where the majority of the materials from the crash saucers went. However, there were certain uh, elements, either they were radioactive or they were unknown fluids or gases or traces of fluids or gases, was it taken to, that part of it was taken to Los Alamos because they had the scientific equipment in order to analyze uh, those elements and materials. Okay, right, yeah, that, that's, that's the big sense, the more sense to me now then. And then one of the later chapters called General's, General's Inquiry, um, I think it's just good to get this context um, there's a quote from this. Kingsley discusses interaction with a scientist who is working on Project Wells, a supercomputer analysis designed to assess the effects and reaction of a culture if the existence of a higher intelligence should be discovered. It's also highly classified under the control of an unnamed secret agency. I just wondered sort of what that, that comment was based on. Well, basically, we've had supercomputers, or the NSA has. I mean, they've got, like, a hundred acres of underground computers at different facilities, including Fort Meade and uh, the Fanex facility and other facilities. Um, the NSA is, is such a key mover. Uh, most people don't realize that when uh, Truman created, uh, I believe it was Truman in 1941, uh, created uh, the CIA and the FBI, he also created the National Security Agency. And the CIA was supposed to, supposed to, uh, investigate overseas people and, and people in America that communicated with people over, overseas if they seemed to be a threat. And the National Security Agency was, was for internal threats and tracking people and information and, uh, make sure classified stuff wasn't revealed or um, certain Americans weren't plotting against America on American soil. But over the years, it's obvious from what's come out in testimony that the CIA has meddled quite often in America as opposed to their charter, and the NSA has meddled in affairs around the world as opposed to their charter and their original intention. So the NSA has, without a doubt, has had the most advanced computers uh, going all the way, way back to the 60s. Uh, like I said, they have acres of underground computers and, and supercomputers. It's just, uh, it's incredible. They would delay corporations releasing breakthrough uh, technology. They would uh, hire the best scientists and engineers and material scientists uh, available to work for the NSA to develop and, and keep the NSA's technology 20 or 30 years ahead of the rest of what was commercially available. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, and then I think also we discussed the, um, the Brookings Institution report, and that being, you know, they, they, they tried to assess the uh, effect of the um, this disclosure of the reality of extraterrestrial civilizations and so on. That, that was done in the 60s, wasn't it, the Brookings Institution report? Well, actually, there were several studies done, uh, in fact, multiple studies by the RAND Corporation and the Brookings Institute and other studies that uh, basically the, the quote Jack Nicholson, uh, you can't handle the truth. In other words, their conclusion was is that uh, civilized people, especially Americans, because of our infrastructure and, and constitution, 
a lot of people believe was based on Christian faith, uh, that it would destroy our faith and therefore destroy our society. Uh, so that was the number one reason they didn't think we could handle the truth and covered it up. But over the ensuing years and decades since then, there's been uncountable atrocities, uh, probably murders, people disappearing, people locked up in prisons or institutes. So, uh, I mean, there's been so many crimes committed as part of this cover-up, keeping the information from us. There's just absolutely hardly anybody that was in charge of committing these crimes and unconstitutional acts that wants to be held accountable. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then also in this chapter, there was just um, the, the other, other thing on that same page was it says the, the research and engineering division of the NSA has picked up numerous transmissions along the 21 meter wavelength band. Kingsley answered, according to a friend of mine in the foreign technology division, who is a member of the NSA's Dundee Society, the NSA began picking up alien transmissions in 1972. Again, I was just curious to know, you know, where that uh, sort of uh, story had come from. Uh, I had contact with people that uh, told me stories. In fact, uh, what kind of proves some of it is <clears throat> the Foreign Technology Division, as it mentioned even in classified documents, uh, some related to the Majestic 12 or MJ-12 group, about the Foreign Technology Division at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, or FTD. Uh, and then if you look at the MJ-12 charter I received, it's in the book, um, it, it, it calls aliens and UFOs foreign artifacts. So I, I think not only did the Foreign Technology Division uh, analyze and reverse engineer our enemies weapon systems and aeronautical systems, but at some point they started uh, analyzing and reverse engineering um, alien technology. Yeah, so it's all part of the sort of tracking and reverse engineering of uh, anything to do with alien technology then? Yes. So at the end of the book, uh, the character of Joe Green, he kind of, you know, without giving away the uh, story too much. He kind of sort of turns into. It's not exactly a, a messianic figure, but it's it's kind of like that. I mean, if people read it, they'll understand my description. I think. So I just wondered, you know, um, where this idea to end the story like that. Um, and don't get the wrong idea about this, folks. It's very interesting, and, and I like the way this was was written. I was very interested in it. Um, but I just wondered where this sort of idea had come from. The idea uh, of the Jexava the alien influence on Earth and, 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 and with Joe Green, the protagonist or hero in the story, uh, and his anxiety over all of it. It was based on several things. One was uh, my religious upbringing, uh, my studies of other religions, um, and even uh, discussions about us possibly having a triple helix at one time, and then for many decades people called a lot of our DNA, junk DNA, and in the last couple of years, they've discovered that what they call for decades junk DNA actually is a functioning uh, part that each each piece of DNA, whether you call it junk or part of the devil helix, actually has a real function that's needed by our bodies. So it was it was a combination of understanding. Uh, DNA and junk DNA and religion and how if um, a lot of people talk about the next false flag is going to be an alien invasion with their alien religion and uh, we'll end up with a, not only a one world order but we'll earn, end up with a one world religion. So it was trying to explore that hypothesis if we in fact did have an outside influence that tried to drive us into a one world religion. Or if we had a false flag where all of a sudden every major prophet is up in the sky through holographic technology to where Jesus is coming back and Muhammad's coming back and uh, all these other uh, prophets and religious figures 
uh, speaking in their own language, basically saying, "Hey, I'm part of this. Uh, I'm part of this alien race, and uh, I only told you part of the story, and, and the whole story is their religion." <laughs> Well, that's that's really great, and uh, I'm glad we've gone through all of those questions for the book, and I, I really do suggest people read it because I think it's a great story that's been put together, mixed in with what Ed has obviously you know, known from his own work, and I think that's the way that that's woven into the story makes it a very interesting read, and um, I certainly uh, you know, got a lot out of it by going through it, and I think anyone that's interested in these kind of topics will get a lot out of it. Um, so that's, 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 I'm really glad to get some of those answers, and it's added a lot to my own, you know, sort of understanding of what you'd written and so on, and the, and the, the sort of motivation behind some of it as well.